His mercy endures
Moses did so, and in the sight of the elders of Israel, he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord there, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. We will read Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us shout to the Lord of his presence in thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are the exhaust The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today we would hearken to hear his voice. Harden our hearts, and your forebears in the wilderness, and your
It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may never be thirsty, or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, saying, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now near, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or, Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. But do not say, do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you. See how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages, and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord.
And it's coming about 50 years after Paul's controversy with the church in Jerusalem about Gentile converts. By this point, Gentile Christians were an accepted reality. This gospel is being written in a time where salvation is seen as open to all. So John casts about and finds a story that would be especially relevant to these Gentile converts. Not that John is creating the story of whole cloth. We know from all the Gospels, they give us qualifiers saying Jesus did many more things than these. We also know that the first few Gospels were much more focused on the salvation of the Jews as God's chosen people. John's Gospel, coming 50 years after the controversy with Peter and Paul, is, at this point, Gentile Christians are making up a fairly large part of the church, maybe even the majority, scholars believe. Paul planted somewhere between 14 and 20 churches on his missionary voyages, so it would make sense that John, in his gospel, would be scanning through all the stories he knew about Jesus to see which ones might speak truth to these Christians who had come from a non-Jewish background. And one of the other things that differentiates John's gospel is that in John's gospel, seeing is often tied closely with believing. In John's gospel, often the religious authorities are labeled as blind. Those who see but do not understand. In last week's reading, Nicodemus, a teacher of the Jews, was unable to understand. And Jesus said to him, you are Israel's teacher. Do you not understand these things? Nicodemus was so focused on knowing that he didn't understand. In this story, though, we have the story of a woman who is not Jewish, who says, I see you are a prophet, after speaking with Jesus for just a few minutes. Her seeing is her believing, and belief brings you to truth in John's Gospel. Some of you may have heard of uh, Nadia Bowles Weber. She's a celebrity pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Um, she's tattooed, has a lot of jewelry, swears a lot. People love her. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons I think people love her, though, is not just that she's sort of the bad girl of the ELCA, but because she's very good at looking at humanity, looking at others, looking at herself, and seeing those things which we find uncomfortable and talk about them. In her book, Pastrix, she's telling this story about how Right after she finished giving one of her rants about stupid people, someone came up to her and said, every time you draw a line between yourself and someone else, you immediately realize that Jesus is on the other side of that line, beckoning you across. In this story, we find Jesus doing exactly that with the Samaritan woman. She wants to draw line after line between herself and Jesus. She says right away, but you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You're a man and I'm a woman. What are you doing talking to me? And Jesus just invites her to ignore those lines. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying you give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She's intrigued. Maybe she didn't expect this sort of interaction. But she's a smart lady, she's quick-witted, she comes right back and says, you don't even have a bucket. Where are you going to get this living water? And then she highlights again that she's a Samaritan, and he's a Jew by pointing out that the well is the well of Jacob, their common ancestor. But even though she doesn't see him as the Messiah right away, she gets to it very quickly. And if you contrast that with Nicodemus the week before, we have to wonder what John was saying. It seems that John wants us to come to the understanding that complacency blinds us from truth. We can get so steeped in the knowledge of something that we fail to see spiritual truths that are right in front of us. This gospel is also differentiated by the fact that the Samaritan woman asks Jesus pointed questions, and Jesus gives her direct answers, which seems very different from what we know of Jesus, that he would just answer her questions point blank. 
But maybe it's not so much that Jesus is speaking differently as the Samaritan woman is listening differently. She's not listening like the Jewish authorities who are trying to reconcile Jesus with all of this stuff that they know about the Messiah. She's just open to hearing what he has to say. Well, tell me about this living water. What about it? And so his statements come across to her clearly. In the Episcopal Church and in many mainline Christian traditions, there is a lot of clergy burnout that we didn't have 50, 60 years ago. People join the clergy, and after three to five years, they say, you know what, never mind, this really isn't for me. I can't do this anymore. And as my spiritual director likes to remind me, one of the reasons for this is that we are so steeped in the knowledge of the faith that we forget to practice it. We're so sure about our knowledge of the liturgy and prayer and scripture that we don't pray ourselves. We don't go to reconciliation. We don't meditate. We don't make time for God in our lives. And I think that's the danger for anyone who isn't a recent convert to Christianity, who isn't soaking all of that knowledge up as fast as they can, asking questions, diving deep into it. We have this danger of being, as John would say, blind. Of being so sure of our knowledge of how this all works that we miss things. We get spiritually complacent. In Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul says, but how much more is Jesus going to save those of us who have said we believe in him? How much more quickly is he going to help us? In Lent, we are offered the chance to say, yeah, <laughs> we have not been doing what we ought to have been doing. We are sinning not so much by what we have done, but as we say in our general confession, by what we have failed to do. We have failed to see Christ in one another. We have failed to see the Messiah in our lives. We have failed <coughs> to see with clear eyes. We get blind. All of us. But Paul reassures us and says that all we have to do is turn back to Christ. Christ will save us. I think it's important that we get this reading in John about the Samaritan woman every Lent. Because it reminds us how strong the faith of a convert can be. The Samaritan woman believed almost instantly. And she ran back to her town and because of her conviction, she brought many more people back to Jesus, and they believed too. And she had no expectation of being believed. This woman was a social outcast. It's not readily apparent by reading the text, but if you go back and you look at some of the historical sociological studies, we know that actually the women would have gone as a group first thing in the morning to get water from the well. It was a time of catching up with friends, a time to share what's going on in their lives. It's cooler in the morning. It's a better time to go get water. They would chit-chat amongst themselves. They didn't have to worry about men overhearing them. And yet this woman is going at noon by herself to the well. She is a social outcast. And we get a sense that Possibly that's because of her five husbands and the gentleman that she has now who is not her husband. But tellingly, Jesus does not condemn her for that. Never once does he call her a sinner. He merely says, you're right to say that you have no husband. He doesn't call her out. Jesus simply sees her as a beloved child of God, worthy of respect. Regardless of the fact that she's a Samaritan, regardless of the fact that she's a woman, he's a man, 
All those barriers, all those lines that other people would draw, Jesus just ignores. Jesus invites us to look at our own lives and see the lines we've drawn between ourselves and others and to step over them. Because as soon as we draw that line, we're going to realize that Jesus is on the other side of that line, waving us across. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit among us. Give us your wisdom. Help us to see with your eyes one another. Help us to see without judgment each of us as beloved children of God. Help us to recognize all of the times in our own lives where we have failed to do what we ought and realize that all we need to do to be in right relation with you is to turn back. In your name we pray. Please join me in the ancient words of the Nicene Creed as we affirm our faith. We believe in one God.
are also celebrating Susan's birthday. Susan is 39 once again. <laughs>
give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. Mary Jane, the 
Sellers family, Bertram, Teresa, Kelly, Rosa, Rakesh, Modu, Hunter, Ron, Bob, and Frank. Remember all who have died in the peace of your Christ, and those whose faith is known to you alone, including Michael Kinney, Walt Sellers, Frank Donaldson, Willie Welch, Houston McGee, Alvin Smith, Andy, Virgil Cannon, Mary Albert, Robert Fogel, and Lou Myrick. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and life. And grant that we may find our inheritance with St. Peter and all the saints who have found favor with you in ancient past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It is the most day of our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the Lord is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Body 
with you. Christ's peace be with you. The Spirit's outpouring be with you. Now and always. Amen. Amen.